Hey everyone, Happy New Year and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. Today we are dropping our first episode of 2021 and we are thrilled to be bringing you Matt Sheehan, a fellow at the Paulson Institute with the digital think tank Macro Polo and author of The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. In this episode, we talk about emerging tech trends he and his colleagues are seeing coming out of China and how that looks to define where China will be at by 2025, as well as which companies or even subsectors are poised for success. We talk to Matt about his thoughts on the anticipated issue of semiconductor restrictions the U.S. is implementing, whether 5G and AI are truly the future of technology leadership for China, and much, much more. Enjoy. I don't foresee chip restrictions, chip export controls, semiconductor export controls, hobbling China's transition to this kind of industrial tech juggernaut that it wants to become. But as we stretch it out further, as we look like 2025 to 2030 and beyond, I do think that restrictions on China's ability to access leading edge semiconductors are eventually going to kind of serve as a a bit of a cap on how far they can go with this kind of foundational technology. So for these next few years, even if you don't have access to the absolute most cutting edge chips, you can still do a lot of what you need to do. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me. Let's dive into your background a little bit. I know that, uh, you know, you, you did some time at Stanford and then graduation off to China. What led to that? Uh, so yeah, a fair amount of happenstance, like probably for most people who end up in China in 2008. So when I was halfway through college, I did, I basically got a summer job in Beijing. I wasn't necessarily looking for a job in Beijing. I was just looking to earn money um, and then maybe travel to Asia after that. But uh, I sort of stumbled into a job as a, a camp counselor at an academic camp in the Hutongs in Beijing and went in knowing basically nothing and knowing zero Chinese. But pretty much as soon as I hit the ground, I just got really excited by the energy of the country, everything. I, you know, I felt like I was learning something every time I stepped outside my door. And so I decided then that as soon as I graduated, which would be in 2010, that I'd be coming back. And so graduated then, took a little bit of Chinese before I went over, took basically a semester's worth and then found a job in Xi'an and ended up there. Now describe to everybody, what is a hutong? Uh, Hutong is basically the this sort of big maze of little alleyways in the center of Beijing. So now they, how far across would they stretch? Maybe two, three miles across in kind of a square in the middle of the city. And it's kind of the old traditional neighborhoods. You know, a lot of the city has been bulldozed and replaced with towers and all the yeah. you know, modern accoutrements. But mm-hmm. the center of the city is still this really fun, you know, twisty maze of alleyways um, to explore. And so it was a great place to land on my first time in China. And when you say that's probably one of the best places to find great food. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Tell us a little bit about what you do now. So we're kind of kind of going to bookend this conversation with the before and then the now, and then we're going to dive down into the middle. So what are you up to now? So now I work as a fellow, a researcher at Macro Polo, which is the think tank of the Paulson Institute. And uh, in Macro Polo, we cover politics, economics, and technology and energy in China. And my portfolio is the technology part of that. So I basically do research, write, do data visualizations, um, multimedia stuff, all on China's technology and its interactions with the U.S. and the rest of the world. And my sort of specific subfield is I focus a lot 
lot on artificial intelligence. So for pretty much the last three years, that's been maybe 90% of my work has been on trying to uh, understand, build frameworks, and then hopefully quantify with data China's AI capabilities and how those interact with the U.S. What are the sources of strength? How does you know talent flow between the two countries? And you know how can each one sort of be more competitive? You are also an author. You've written a book called The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. Tell us a little bit about what that book is about. Sure. So that book came about in kind of a, a natural way in that when I was living in China, eventually I got a job as a journalist and I ran into some visa problems. And so I had to spend about seven, eight months back in California, sort of in the middle of my time in China. And I just started noticing, this is 2013, 14, and started noticing how many new connections were being built between all different kinds of sectors in China and California. So the connections between Silicon Valley and China were growing, between Hollywood and China were growing. You had a lot of Chinese students uh, showing up at California universities, home buyers, all these different kind of dimensions of it. And so sort of the thesis of the book and, and what went into it was uh, thinking of California as kind of ground zero for a new era and a new type of U.S.-China relations. I think, you know, prior to 2010, it was a very kind of distant trade-based relationship. You know, they buy a lot of treasuries from us. We buy a lot of cheap goods from them, but it's very much at a distance. And the argument was that, you know, in this decade from say 2010 to 2018 or 2008 to 2018, you started seeing the relationship between the two countries get much more, uh, ground level and much more face to face. All of these Chinese students, Chinese investors, Chinese immigrants, home buyers were coming to the US and it was creating kind of new opportunities and new frictions along each of those dimensions. And so the book uh, is kind of written in a journalistic style, married to some of the analytical stuff that I do now, looking at how China and California kind of simultaneously collaborate and compete with each other in each of these areas. So how does Silicon Valley relate to China? How does Hollywood relate to China? And showing that, you know, you kind of, even as these two regions or two countries are getting closer together, that, that closeness also brings a lot of new frictions. And I think that's part of what we've seen play out over the last couple of years. So you're juxtaposing, even just in the title, the, the collaborate versus compete, okay? So first of all, even before that, what is special about California? Why not other West Coast states or the rest of the U.S.? Yeah, California, partly by, uh, partly by luck and partly by design, it has a lot of what China was and is looking for what China wants to become in a lot of ways. So, you know, if we kind of wind the clock back to 2010, you're in this period of time, China's emerging out of the financial crisis. It's had this big real estate boom, um, you know, kind of a big investment boom, but it wants to transition to a more high value add um, service driven economy, consumption driven economy, kind of moving away from the old model of uh, heavy urbanization, heavy industry, and a lot of cheap exports to the rest of the world. It wanted to become an innovative country. It wanted to become a country with strong cultural industries. And, you know, you kind of just look around the globe and where is the global epicenter of innovative technology? Silicon Valley, where is the global epicenter of sort of high profile, big budget uh, commercial culture? That's Hollywood. And so you saw a lot of both Chinese, you know, Chinese people, Chinese companies and the Chinese government just displaying kind of an outsized interest in California. And in this period of time, 2008, 2018, California ended up kind of leading all other U.S. states in almost every dimension of interaction. So California took on more Chinese investment, more Chinese immigrants, um, more Chinese tourists, more Chinese students than any other state in the country. And so, you know, I think I kind of lucked into it and stumbled into it. I happened to be from California. I happened to love California. And when I recognized that, you know, my home state was kind of building such a unique and, and deeply integrated relationship with China, I, I wanted to explore that. Tell us a little bit more about the two sides of the coin. How is California at being able to do both at the same time when it comes to collaborate and compete? Sure. So, you know, maybe just to kind of 
narrow it down a little bit. I'll just talk on the technology front, which is what I sort of spend the most time on these days. Sure. So the the connections between California and China or Silicon Valley and China were really like multifaceted and 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 rich. It's a lot of times I think back in the day, maybe five, 10 years ago, we'd say, well, you know, US companies are blocked in China. And so, you know, the 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 Chinese tech ecosystem and the US tech ecosystem is divided. But if you look at it across the more like grassroots dimensions, so people connections between people, connections like investment ties intellectual ties and and supply chain ties to really deeply integrated. You had Google setting up uh, research labs in Beijing, Microsoft doing the same, Facebook doing the same. You had uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu all setting up research labs in California. Tencent was actually in Seattle. Um, so you, you have both sides wanting to kind of draw on resources, draw on talent from the other side and work together in these kind of collaborative settings. But then when you look at the kind of the, the business side and the product side, they're most definitely competing with each other. You know, TikTok and Facebook are obviously going head to head in a lot of different markets. Um, Xiaomi and Apple, many of these companies end up going head to head. And I think over the last two years, we've seen kind of bringing a much more big like national level competition to things. So previously, I think a lot of the action was very much at the local level in terms of individual investors, venture capitalists and companies. And now we've also imposed this big sort of national geopolitical competition over all of that. So I think maybe kind of the challenge these days for people looking to um, get involved in China, either from a business perspective or from like a policy perspective is, can you hold these two thoughts in your head at the same time? Can China both be uh, a great resource of talent? Can it be someone that you want to collaborate with on certain issues? And then can you also compete and, you know, compete very intensely with China on other issues? I think that's kind of the challenge ahead. I also wanted to quickly touch on another project uh, that you've been involved with, uh, and that was the Iowa China podcast. Tell us a little bit about that project. Sure. Yeah. So I, you know, California and China, they have a really unique relationship and a really close one. And the place where I work, the Paulson Institute is based in Chicago. And so I've started spending a lot more time in the Midwest lately. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, in the course of that, I realized that uh, another state with a very (laughs) unique multifaceted relationship to China is Iowa. Um, You know, I think that maybe catches a lot of people off guard, but that's why I wanted to ask you. Cause I thought, well, you know, California, I get it. Totally makes sense. <laughs> you know, we had Ann Kokus on the, on the, the podcast before talking about Hollywood made in China and all this, you know, these other things. Yeah. I mean, so California, I mean, essentially you're right. Totally makes sense. That's why I wanted to ask you about it. But Iowa. Yeah. I was kind of sneaky important in the U S China relationship, especially over the last two years. So, I mean, the most obvious and the sort of the biggest connection is in agriculture and, you know, Iowa is number one in two, number one or number two in like corn and soybean exports to China every year. Um, Those are huge industries in Iowa that really power the state. And then when you look at some of the other dimensions, uh, especially like students, the Chinese students have been a really big part of uh, sort of a, a boom in funding for Iowa public universities like universities, public universities all over the country, Iowa schools were hit very hard after the financial crisis and they saw a big fall in public funding. And like a lot of other places, Iowa sort of opened its doors to international students who pay full tuition and therefore, you know, can in some way sort of subsidize or be a a financial infusion for the public universities. So Iowa has the agriculture ties. It has very strong educational ties. And then over the last few years, it kind of doubled down on that with, um, the governor of Iowa, the former governor of Iowa being named as the ambassador to China, Terry Branstad. And he served in that position, I think, for all four years of the Trump administration and ended up playing a pretty important role at some pivotal points. So, you know, he very much had a perspective on the way that these type of grassroots ties, whether that's more in the agriculture, but especially in the student realm, the way that these are important to subnational entities in the U.S. That's not just all about the federal government. He'd been a president of an Iowa university, I think, in around 2010-11. And so when President Trump was uh, reportedly sort of uh, playing with the idea of maybe having an all-out ban on Chinese student visas, 
um, coming to the U S it was Terry Brandstad who reportedly stepped in and said, you know, Hey, this is going to end up hurting universities that are very much, you know, in your base, in your target States. And so we need to walk this back. And so in the podcast on Iowa China ties, we looked at those dimensions, the agriculture, the student dimension. It's also a big manufacturing dimension. A lot of uh, the manufacturing base in Iowa was hit pretty hard by the boom of made in China goods. And so we kind of wanted to pull at all these threads and do it. We did it. We did the podcast series in the run up to the Iowa caucuses and see, you know, China obviously featured in uh, you know, the election this cycle. And so how do a bunch of Democratic candidates who are vying for the post, how do they talk about, you know, simultaneously, maybe they need to talk tough on China, but they also want to uh, do it in a way that doesn't hurt Iowa farmers. And so, yeah, in, in the podcast, we made like six trips out to Iowa in 2019 and uh, talked to a whole bunch of people, farmers, students, you know, mayors, small businesses about how China ends up relating to their own work and their own lives. And, and yeah, just try to, to kind of paint a multidimensional picture of the way that these two places interact. I'd like to now key in on some of the trends, especially in tech in China that you're seeing. So tell us a little bit about just talk in a high level. What are some of the trends in tech in China that you're seeing emerge right now? Yeah, I'd maybe kind of put it into like two big buckets, one of which is a little bit more about like, you know, the national national level tech uh goals, what the Chinese government is trying to do for China is like a total tech ecosystem. And then maybe a little bit more sort of industry specific, uh, business driven. So at the kind of national level, clearly one of the biggest trends right now is the the drive for self-sufficiency. Um, over the last few years with uh, export controls on chips to companies like Huawei in particular, ZTE, it's become very clear to the Chinese government and to a lot of people in industry that they're hugely reliant on the United States and Europe for a lot of their kind of deep tech, the really foundational pieces of technology that it takes to kind of keep the ecosystem alive um, in semiconductors and chips. And I think that that has been a real wake up call and has now become a, a very high level national priority. So you saw that written into the five year plan, the draft that was just released uh, at the end of October, beginning of November, making sort of technological self-sufficiency a, a pillar of national goals. So I think that's a very big, broad push and one that's going to get a lot of activity over the next couple of years. And then maybe looking at more from like a business perspective and what the companies are in themselves are going after. I, my prediction is that a, a big area is going to be applying emerging tech. So AI, internet of things, blockchain, et cetera, applying that tech to traditional industries like manufacturing, like energy, like transportation, um, you know, th things that were for a long time, for decades, the real engines of growth and the kind of China boom, China miracle, but that in recent years over the last decade, say, have sort of the growth coming from them have slowed a lot because of maybe rising, uh, rising costs of labor. So that ends up hitting the export markets a little bit. You know, they have goals of upgrading their energy infrastructure to, you know, clean up the skies, uh, transportation, sort of smoothing out a lot of the urban snarl that happens in Chinese cities. And so I think we sort of the last decade, 2010 to 2020, was an era for building of a lot of like digital platforms, but specifically, you know, entertainment, social networking, or like commerce platforms. And I think the the switch that we're going to see is from these kind of consumer facing apps to a lot of business to business technology applications and trying to use things like, say, computer vision to upgrade like a manufacturing ecosystem or maybe blockchain to deal with uh, grid management and information security, those type of things. Do you think that there is going to be an issue that China is going to face with regards to trust 
as they move into more more production of, of and getting into the you know enterprise software and, and, and b2b game i mean i know that there's yeah. already a level out there and i know that you know maybe you can speak to this too i know you have a background you you know working with huff post on on uh in 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 journalism and, and stuff in the past so you might understand this how that you know the propaganda machine can start to roll out to try to create enhanced mistrust that comes right. out of this side of the ocean to try to give local a leg up um, over right. China. So maybe you, you might be able to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's already a pretty big problem and maybe it's going to be an increasingly big problem for China mm-hmm. going forward. The, you know, the fact is that as we move from uh, a lot of traditional Chinese exports, low technology things, non-digital exports into a world of platforms and software and digital technology. There are huge concerns in countries all over the world about, you know, is this secure? Uh, what's it doing with my data, et cetera, et cetera. And those, you know, those, that kind of trust is hard enough to win in a country like the United States or a country like Europe. If you're even an American or a European company, mm-hmm. we're already kind of very sensitive about that. And China just uh, does not have a great track record on these issues. And I think it's going to be a real limitation for a lot of its technology companies. And we see it over just the past year or so with uh, TikTok in the United States and in India and elsewhere. You know, these were clearly the the ban that happened in India and the sort of attempted ban that happened in the United States. These were clearly very like geopolitical moves and and politics driven moves. But I think they resonate with a lot of people who have sort of a a baseline level of mistrust about uh, Chinese technology and the way that it will handle data and whether or not companies coming out of China can act, you know, 100 percent independently of the government. So, yeah, I think these are kind of tough issues to untangle in any market or when you're relating to any government. But um, Chinese companies are going to face an even bigger hurdle with that. And I think, you know, there, there's still a lot of growth to happen totally internal to China. It's not like they need to start exporting uh, digital platforms and exporting enterprise software to be profitable and to grow. But eventually you do serve your own very large domestic market and you do want to start to look abroad for new growth opportunities. And I think that's going to be a it's going to be a big hurdle for Chinese companies. I'm going to say something and I don't want the audience to think that I'm in any way, shape or form putting words in your mouth. So this is just my thoughts that I'd like your comment on. But I feel like China is really working hard. They are trying to grow up, but there is occasionally bad behavior from the past that still makes it into makes it into the light it gets picked up by some of the mainstream medias and then of course blasted out there so they are still kind of paying the price for some of their missteps when they were adolescents and Mm. sometimes it pops back up and bites them in the butt um but i do firmly believe that they are trying to move forward they are trying to be better and uh they are kind of wearing their adult pants right now and and are trying to be better behaved would you agree i think one of the kind of interesting sort of subplots of the last few years has been the way that China has tried to build up its own data privacy and data security laws within China. And, you know, I think most people, the sort of baseline assumption in Western countries is that, oh, it's a total free for all. And, you know, the government and companies, they have access to everything and nobody respects privacy of any kind. And that's obviously, you know, a caricature that it can't be 100% true. And when it comes to sort of like the the corporate or the commercial abuses of data privacy, they have made major strides in that department. They've started doing a lot more prosecutions when there are illegal data leaks. um, And that's prosecuting their own companies or, you know, Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. And so that's Mm -hmm. like a real step forward. But when it gets to the question of, uh, you know, should the government, if sort of push comes to shove, will the government be able to gain access to um, 
data that is generated or stored within China. I think, you know, with stuff like the cybersecurity law of 2017, they've really expanded the purview of what can fall under sort of quote unquote national security issues that would allow the government to gain access to those areas. And so, you know, it's going to be a very nuanced kind of multifaceted uh, discussion over there. And I think, yeah, while China's Mm -hmm. kind of doing better on protecting uh, its own citizens from sort of corporate abuses of data privacy. I think they're kind of going in the opposite direction when it comes to government access. And, you know, even though that's going to end up being a very nuanced picture, when people abroad are dealing with it, they clearly don't have time to, uh, you know, judge all these things. The normal users of apps and, and digital platforms are not going to be sort of taking a close look at the protections afforded in the latest, you know, uh, cybersecurity law or whatnot. There's just going to have a kind of a blunt picture of it that says, eh, China data, I don't know about that. So I think that's going to be the hurdle yeah. going forward. Macropolo, which is, what is, how, how would you, Macro Polo at Paulson, like what, what, what is it? A, a division of the think tank? What, so what? Macro Polo, yeah. <laughs> Macro Polo is the think tank of the Paulson Institute. The Paulson Institute has kind of okay. two different arms. They do a lot uh, okay. of um, like research work on, let's say, I, I'm trying to get the exact descriptor right in terms of how these different parts describe themselves. But basically there's a big, there's a big part of the Paulson Institute that works on conservation issues in the U.S. and China. They do. They help uh, train Chinese mayors in sort of best practices. They work with China on sort of wetland conservation and building up its own national park system. And then on the other half of the Paulson Institute is Macro Polo, which is the think tank. And that's designed, you know, to produce research. And that's what we do. Mm hmm. Okay, so you know, I mean, I'm glad that I'm. I, it wasn't just me <laughs> having a little bit of trouble trying to. Sure. When I did some research, I'm like, how do I place this? Um, but what you just said, and I want, I want to go there for a second. There are so many organizations around the world, like Paulson, so many good people, good organizations doing great things that are really, really collaborating on so many kind of global issues. What? How is it? that the representation to the public can be that it is so combative as a relationship when underneath the surface, there are so many amazing collaborations going on. Yeah. I mean, a a lot of the best kind of collaborative work on this is not, uh, it's not like headline grabby stuff usually. So, you know, Paulson Institute, that's my own thing. Of course, I admire that a lot. But like, for example, there's been a lot of really good, important work done by the state of California um, in working with China on climate change. And this is a lot of it's been led by Jerry Brown, the former governor, who as governor Mm -hmm. did a lot of uh, sort of climate diplomacy with China, signed a lot of agreements between California and different Chinese provinces on sort of working together on climate change issues. But at the end of the day, it's not, um, it's just not as sexy and it's not as headline grabby. And it's also, Mm -hmm. it's how to put it. It's not like what has changed the most dramatically in recent years. Clearly what has changed the most dramatically is how does the U S government relate to the Chinese government? How do we think about Chinese uh, companies and Chinese technology inside of the United States? And that's, you know, that's been where the change is. That's been where the activity is. And that's, you know, in many ways, the flashiest and the loudest part of the relationship. So, you know, as a as a former journalist, I understand the, uh, the the pressures that everyone is under to produce something that feels new, produce something that you can, you know, has a conflict, has a tension to it. And uh, yeah, that's that's obviously where a lot of the coverage is going to go. It seems like if it can't become an attention beacon or be weaponized politically, then it just doesn't seem to make it in front of you. Yeah. I know that's the the fundamental rule of the internet, I think. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a level of inevitability about that. Macro Polo put out a report in October uh, about what China would look like in 2025. Can you give us a brief overview of the key takeaways? Sure. So the report covered kind of all the, 
the sectors that we look at, economics, politics, technology, and energy. Um, I won't try to speak for my colleagues who handle those other sections. I think they're all interesting and, and you know, pretty good analytical insights to it. But I, I covered the technology section for that. And what I did in that, in terms of the forecast, was I you know, first had to kind of narrow the question, like, what is Chinese technology going to look like in 2025? Who knows? Like, it's way too big of a beast to try to make a total yeah. sector industry-wide prediction. So I sort of narrowed it down to you know, one or two key trends that I think are going to really shape things. And and those kind of relate back to what I was talking about earlier when you, when you asked about key trends in the Chinese sector, uh, technology sector. Mm -hmm. So I sort of identified in terms of like a, yeah, the industry sector-wide trend is this move from sort of consumer facing platforms to companies that apply emerging technology to traditional industries. And then in terms of, you know, is this going to work out? Is this going to like, uh, is this going to be successful for China? I looked at as the main obstacle there, um, restrictions on uh, semiconductor exports to China are, you know, are us restrictions on chips going to fundamentally handicap China's attempt to transition into this more like industrial technology, uh, era. Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of detail in there that, you know, you can, of course, find in the report. But I'd say the high level takeaway was that on this five year time scale, 2020 to 2025, I don't foresee chip restrictions, chip export controls, semiconductor export controls, hobbling China's transition to this kind of industrial tech juggernaut that it wants to become. But as we stretch it out further, as we look like 2025 to 2030 and beyond, I do think that restrictions on China's ability to access leading edge semiconductors are eventually going to kind of serve as a, a bit of a cap on how far they can go with this kind of foundational technology. So for these next few years, even if you don't have access to the absolute most cutting edge chips, you can still do a lot of what you need to do. If you want to build a more like automated factory, or you want to build a 5G network, or you want to build... Um, you know, a, a smart grid, most of these type of applications don't require the absolute most cutting edge chips that the U S and other places kind of have a, a bit of a monopoly on. So I think, you know, in, in the short term, uh, uh, U S export controls to, to Huawei are probably going to slow down the 5g rollout, which is obviously received a ton mm -hmm. of attention, but they're mm -hmm. not going to fundamentally you know, hobble the Chinese technology ecosystem. It'll be more about um, kind of trying to maintain China's long-term dependence on the United States and its allies in Europe, Japan, South Korea, maintain China's dependence on those countries for cutting edge semiconductors. And as the industry kind of keeps advancing, the the I think the goal for a lot of U.S. policymakers is don't you know don't try to totally uh, obliterate the Chinese tech ecosystem. That's a very dangerous and volatile uh, thing to try to do. But do maintain do keep China dependent on on these exports, and that then kind of gives long term leverage to the to the U.S. and its allies. What sectors do you think it might negatively impact or? Uh, slow down. So yeah, I mean the 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 big one at the moment is um, is the five G rollout, which whether you count five G as like a sector or just kind of an enabling technology layer, that's the big one. Uh, Huawei was had, I believe, I forget if it was over forty percent or over sixty percent of all the five G uh, contracts in China were through Huawei, and you know Huawei is the one company that has truly had its access to. Um, global chips cut off. It still has access to some of them and it can still get a, some small amount of supply from within China. But by and large, Huawei is in a lot of trouble on this. And they're, what they're looking to do is uh, allegedly the plan is for Huawei to build its own chip fab. So it's able to manufacture its own chips domestically on like a one to two year time scale. But <clears throat> 
that's that's a very uh, ambitious goal. And I think there's a lot of doubt as to whether they're actually going to be able to pull this off. So in terms of the most direct effects, I think it's going to seriously damage Huawei, maybe even be kind of a death knell for Huawei. And that will lead to a maybe a two to three year delay in how China rolls out 5G. I think the other sector that is uh, likely to be targeted for a bunch of stuff is uh, surveillance technology. So you know, this is uh, when we're looking at when the U.S. or its allies are trying to uh, impose export controls for human rights reasons. Um, they are usually targeting like China's facial recognition companies or companies that are kind of uh, affiliated with that architecture more broadly. And so far, I would say these have not been all that effective because the U.S. was kind of acting unilaterally on this, and it you know it didn't truly cut off exports from all these countries, but. If the Biden administration decides to get more multilateral and more comprehensive in how they impose those controls, then that could be a really big hit to China's surveillance industry. We hear a lot about 5G and AI, you know, just when we're talking to just most anybody about China technology these days. A, how significantly do you believe that those technologies will transform Chinese society Mm-hmm. And are there any other technologies that you think are flying under the radar right now that will have as big or bigger impact on Chinese business and consumers? Clearly AI and also blockchain and others, whatever. They've they've gone through the hype cycle and we've heard tons about them. And, you know, realistically, uh, technology like AI has already made a lot of money for a lot of people, but it's usually been in the very... Um, you know, low key way of uh, just making online platforms more efficient, making, you know, Amazon's predictions more accurate, making Google able to serve you better ads and all that stuff or same in Baidu and Alibaba. But, you know, for someone like me who uh, is not an investor in these companies, that's clearly not my top priority. I want the I'm, my hope is that these technologies really do end up affecting human lives and ordinary people's lives in a much better way. And so in terms of those kind of impacts, I think the biggest, clearly the biggest transformation within China has been the, thus far has been the rise of surveillance technology throughout the country. I mean, that's a very uh, physical in the world, real world implications for people and political systems and all that. So I'd say that's been like the, the biggest real world social transformation of the last five years. I think if this continues to sort of realize its promise in a lot of ways, then hopefully the next five years will be much more about the impact on energy and transportation. I think there's a kind of a lot of um, low hanging fruit when it comes to how to better make uh, energy systems more efficient using AI, but also using blockchain, Uh, not my area, but something I hear friends in energy talking a lot about um, in China. And so I think the the kind of vision that a lot of Chinese leaders have of the way these technologies are going to affect society is, you know, they will uh, untangle all the messy traffic of urban centers, whether that's through autonomous vehicles that move much smoother through traffic, or even the probably the lighter touch version of this is just the smart city model that has been kind of pioneered in places like Hangzhou, or even just through using computer vision and algorithmic management of their traffic systems of their traffic lights they've been able to have like real you know 10 15 plus percent improvements in the flows of traffic and so i think that's kind of a a pretty tangible way that we just see the chinese leadership sees their cities just operating more efficiently um, and with greater control in a lot of ways and so i think that's probably what we're most likely to see over the over the coming years in terms of other technologies that might have a greater impact i'm really uh i'm really in my ai rabbit hole these last couple of years <laughs> so I've, I've i fully acknowledge i've drunk the kool-aid you know i'm, I'm my head's in the sand over there yeah uh, obviously a lot of people talk about biotechnology being the kind of quote-unquote next big thing that could totally be the case i just don't know about it how is it that china and i think i have a you know i'm asking a leading question because i think i know but how Mm. is it that china has the ability um, to really be leaping so far ahead and i'm just gonna say it because i think that they are leaping so far ahead in ai i think you know, there, there's clearly a big divide here between implementation 
and cutting edge research. True. <laughs> and China is uh, very much catching up in cutting edge research, but I wouldn't say it's leaping ahead yet. I think on the the implementation phases, obviously where they tend to excel and. <laughs> I think, you know, this is getting to be a bit of a hand wavy uh, description of it. I think there's, you know, there's very like tangible uh, kind of, uh, you know, you add up the talent inflows and the investment flows and all of that. I think that definitely points to something, but I, I think just functionally at a very large, at a very macro level, um, China, the society is just a little bit more malleable and more nimble in how it moves about things in the U S you know, our, our cities, like the systems that our cities run on are very, uh, kind of deeply entrenched, embedded systems. And you're not, you know, if you're the mayor of a city here, you're not just going to suddenly call up Google and say, Hey, like, why don't you, you know, just run some experiments and try to improve the way our traffic lights function and, and improve traffic in the city. You know, they're, uh, they would run to all kinds of political and bureaucratic hurdles to doing that. And they're just kind of not incentivized to do this in an electoral system where you're, you know, much more punished for downside mistakes than rewarded for experimenting with stuff. And so I think this kind of combination of like overall Chinese citizens, companies, industries, they are used to doing like a total overhaul of what they do every five years. And so they're very eager to adopt. And you combine that with a government that has an ability to, you know, it can't just wave a magic wand and make things happen, but it can drum up a lot of excitement. And in that excitement, kind of drive a lot of funding into drive a lot of experiment, experimentation in areas. And, and since 2017, when they released the AI plan, you saw one of these huge bubbles, you know, of uh, tons of funding, tons of new startups, tons of people studying AI, tons more coverage of it. And, you know, that there's a little bit of a boom bust. And I think in a lot of ways, we've seen the the kind of excitement levels come down on AI in China. But even if there's a lot of messiness, a lot of wasted investments, a lot of hype, kind of when the dust, when the dust settles, um, they have made a major leap forward in that. And, and that kind of doesn't go into reverse. I'm so glad that you said that because I think, and I've done some interviews before, uh, you know, Kaifu Lee's, oh, it's just all about AI and China's AI and things. And everybody, I think, defaults to um, data. And mm. I'm like, data is good in principle, but how do you apply it? And and put it into applications. And in order to be able to do that, I think you need to look bigger. Um, and so as you alluded to, it's about uh, the fabric of society and government and how, the, like you put it as being malleable, uh, which was mm -hmm. a, a great descriptor. How far has China come in being malleable, in being entrepreneurial and in just accepting right. that there's random stuff going on around me? And it's probably, oh, that's just us leaping forward and creating and testing new things. Um, and everybody just so accept it, accepts it mm. when 10, 15 years ago, this was absolutely not the case. Do you have any kind of insights into how they were able to just overhaul themselves as a society be, to be so accepting and malleable over, over this hmm. sh such a short period of time. I guess I think I, I chalk it up kind of to the, the, just how much things have changed on like a 40 year time scale. I mean, if you're a 65 year old person, like what have you seen? You've seen Maoist China, you've seen a uh, totally sort of state command and control economy. You've seen fortunes change kind of overnight in the early days of reform and opening. And I think the kind of the psychological impact of a lot of that is, is really telling like mm. the, the, the tendency of, of when, when there's a new hot sector. So this was AI a few years ago, this was, you know, group on imitators 10 years ago, when there is a, a sense that something is taking off. I think a lot of people over the course of their lives, they've seen that kind of the first person to rush into a sector is there's a potential for huge rewards. If you early on in the eighties or the nineties, you got into manufacturing early, or you got into real estate early, or you got into any of these things early, there was a chance that you just totally took off into another stratosphere of wealth. And, you know, it adds a kind of urgency to everything in life. 
And I think that that, um, that, that drives a lot of this kind of like aggressive, um, aggressive push to get in on the next thing. And I don't think it's like totally healthy from a personal mental health perspective. I think it leads to a lot of like society wide anxiety and nervousness and tension, but it does, um, it does drive these cycles and it does make things move really quickly. I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, and that was really interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, but put it over a longer period, you know, uh, a bigger graph. And all of a sudden you start to see that there's been many peaks and valleys in a short period of time. It just hasn't been in the last 10 years, um, you know, from, you know, from Mao Zedong and, and, you know, having to come out and then, you know, and it's just a change after change after change. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And I, I think now it's probably a land of, of strong opinions loosely held. And so <laughs> yeah. they are very much more malleable as we've now seen globally. Let's talk a little bit about Silicon Valley and, um, you know, you come from California, you've done a lot of deep diving here. What does Silicon Valley think about China, Chinese tech, Chinese startups? Uh, you put out a great chart, um, that's far more visual than we're going to be able to describe here on the podcast, but can you describe it as best you can about how the perception of China and the Valley has evolved over the last 10 years or so? Uh, and what do you kind of, uh, what do you point to? when trying to make sense of these evolutions? Yeah, I think, you know, the key here is new is like a multidimensional relationship between Silicon Valley and China or in Chinese tech. You know, a lot of times because I do a lot of work on Silicon Valley in China, you know, reporters will come to me asking, you know, okay, you know, how does China think about Silicon, how does Silicon Valley think about China? And they're expecting like a one dimensional, well, they used to be excited and now they're scared or they used to be, uh, used to think they were copycats and now they are innovators. And I think, you know, all of those have some element of truth in, if you just look at that one dimension, but the, the interesting thing about the last 10 years and about this relationship is that depending on who you are and what period of time you are in, you think about a different element of China is taking is taking to the fore. So maybe 10 years ago, as sort of illustrated in the chart, I took five different dimensions. I took, you know, China as copycat, China as market, China as warning sign, China as competitor, and China as inspiration. And sort of charted how did how prominent has each of these things been over the last 10 years? When did sort of China as competitor really come to the fore? When did we stop? How did we evolve away from thinking of China as copycat? And so, you know, in the chart I show in, in from say 2010 to 2013, like the dominant perception, the, the one that's highest in the chart is copycat. Um, while the one that's lowest in the chart is inspiration and, you know, uh, China as warning sign, China's competitor are kind of low on the chart as well. But then starting around 2013, 2014, you had uh, China as market and China as a uh, competitor, China's inspiration all kind of start taking off and they surpass copycat, you know, as market, this is when you have Uber, Airbnb, LinkedIn, all getting into China, Google and Facebook trying very hard to get into China. Apple's having its kind of China renaissance at this point in time. And then it, it kind of continues changing over time. I think from 2017 onwards, the kind of China as market sort of slowly started to decline and really declined in the last two years as tech tensions went up. But at the same time, China as competitor really took off during that period of time. You know, China as it was a head to head competitor obviously with Uber, Airbnb, et cetera. And now it's kind of a global competitor in the form of TikTok or in developing markets, you know, Xiaomi competing with Apple in India, stuff like that. So, you know, you, uh, folks who want to look at the chart and kind of track everything in there, they can look up, uh, it's called How Silicon Valley Views China. And it's on macropolo.org um, under my name. But yeah, it's 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 my attempt to kind of visualize what's been a really multidimensional and then really dynamic relationship over the last 10 years, something that can't just be summarized in sort of one sentence or, or one dimension. Matt Sheehan, fellow at the Paulson Institute with the digital think tank Macro Polo and author of The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. Thank you very much for being on the show and joining us on the negotiation. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. 
The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.